I want now to continue looking at African traditional religion, particularly as it relates to creating harmony and affirmation for the person and for the community. There is a term, there is a term that Africans use to describe this. I am because we are. And we are because I am. I am because we are, we are because I am. It means that as a person, I experience personhood as being part of a community. And as a community, we experience community because persons are involved in the community. The community forms the person, and the person in turn forms the community. I am because we are, we are because I am. And so all relationships in the African uh, experience are developed in ways to affirm that reality. The United States Declaration of Independence says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That would not be an African way of saying it, because that declaration is a declaration of individual independence. Uh, within African understanding of community and personhood, there is no such thing as individual independence. It is David Shank becoming a person through his involvement in community, not through independence, but through community. And that reality is experienced from the moment a child is born, even when it is still unborn. It's part of a community, part of a village. And when the child is born, the uh, parents and the community will be experimenting with different names for a while. We mentioned this the other day. Um, is this the name for the child? Well, no, that doesn't quite fit. Is this the name? No, no. And so it may take some time, weeks even, before a final decision is made as to what the name of the child should be. Because the name needs to fit the child as it is functioning within the community. How does it react to its mother and to its father and so forth? All of those considerations go into the decision of what the name will actually be. And then we mentioned the other day how that uh, after the naming experience, then the child begins the process of moving upward, upward, upward in the hierarchy. Um, and God is at the pinnacle of that, of that hierarchy. God is at the apex of that hierarchy. And so the child begins the process of moving upward, moving upward, moving upward, through the hierarchy, and by the time it gets to be uh, 76 years old as I am, why it is getting further and further towards the time when it will transition now and become part of the community of the living dead. So even upon death, it does not mean that the person is independent. The person is part of a community of the living dead, of the ancestral spirits, when it transitions from life to death. Uh, or to they, 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 uh, they use the word uh, having to do with transition, moving from the one mode of experience and living until the other mode, the, the, the mode of the living dead. But all of that is communitarian. The ancestral world and the living world are really intercepting together. They, they function together in a harmonious uh, relationship. That is the goal. Now, you might say, you might observe here that within this construct, there is a fundamental problem when you think of the modern nation state. 
because each tribe has its hierarchy. So, for example, I grew up among the Zanaki. They had their hierarchy. They had their hi hierarchy with the chief at the top of that hierarchy. But then nearby was the Wakiroba tribe. <laughs> they had their hierarchy with their chief. Okay? And then nearby was another tribe called the Jita. And they had their hierarchy with their, with their chief. And so each tribal system has its own hierarchical system. And that presents very special problems and challenges in the modern world where you're trying to form communities into a nation state. And that's the heart of the experience of conflict in the African experience from time to time. Like right now, I'm grieving very, very deeply about what is happening in southern Sudan where for years they struggled for independence from the, uh, uh, from the northern Sudan, which was uh, basically also a struggle between different hierarchies because the north was Arab and the south was Nilotic African. But finally they got their independence. But now in the south also, different tribes are beginning to go to war with one another. What's going on? They're trying to form a nation state which brings together many hierarchies into one national community. That's what they're trying to do in the nation state. But how do you cope with these different hierarchies, these different systems uh, of power and authority? And it's very, very difficult oftentimes. The community, the community, which is the inter-tribe, inter-hierarchical community as none other is the church. Because within the church, you have people from this hierarchy and this hierarchy and this hierarchy and this hierarchy who all are part of a new community called the worldwide church. So the church becomes an inter-hierarchical community and in a very special sense, carries very special responsibilities in the African experience for maintaining the peace. And I pray and I hope that in southern Sudan, the church will step forward and be the church attempting to build relationships between these different hierarchies, which are right now really in conflict with one another and uh, tragic conflict. So that's what's going on. These tribal systems trying to form a broader community, how do you do that? And as I said, the church has a special responsibility to carry forward that enterprise of building intertribal and interhierarchical relationships. That's the work of the church in this very special way. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. And it, the quest for harmony and peaceful relationships is supremely ev evident in the African commitment to hospitality. I have visited in many homes around the world, but I must say African hospitality never ceases to astonish me. Um, they're very generous people. A friend of mine told me on one occasion that when he was an African friend, when he was a young boy living out in the, in the farmlands of Kenya, that when lunchtime would come or supper time would come, his father would step out of the household and go to a little hill nearby. And he would look to the south, east, north, west, to see if there's anybody walking even a mile away. And if he saw someone walking, he would shout, Ho! It's supper time! Come and join me for supper! And so he would call this person walking the byways uh, to come and enjoy dinner with him, even if he did not know the person. Could you imagine someone here in this city opening the window and seeing someone walk by and say, Ho! Come upstairs and enjoy supper with me! That's how his father would do. 
generous hospitality is very characteristic of African societies. In fact, among the Kikuyu that I referred to several times in these lectures, um, they, uh, they had the practice of building granaries at the places, that's supposed to be a granary, a place where you store grain, okay? A tiny little granary. They would build these granaries at the places where the roads intersected. They didn't have vehicles in those days, but people walked. And so here's a path going in this direction and a path coming here. They intersect here. At the intersection points, they would build, the local community would build a little granary and keep it stocked with grain. Why? So that if a stranger is going on a journey across Kikuyu land and he is hungry, he could stop at one of those little granaries, take food, and cook a little meal right there at the interception of the two roads, and then go on his way rejoicing for he had been fed. Hospitality for the guests, for the stranger who's walking the byways, providing that little granary so that they could have ample food to eat. Um, hospitality. When I visit in Africa and I'm walking or driving and I stop at someone's home, it is almost impossible to leave without having a chicken meal. Now when you go in and you sit down and you're on your journey and you want to be on your way, all at once you hear a chicken out in the yard running and someone running after the chicken. You say, wait, 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 what's happening, what's happening, what's happening? We're gonna kill a chicken for you. Oh, well, you know, really, I need to press on. Thank you so very, very much. But if you don't stop uh, them, uh, they will very quickly kill a chicken and have a feast for you. And always, just always, uh, a cup of tea is served. Even if you don't stay long enough for a chicken, you always get a cup of tea. Um, and then when the guest is ready to leave, uh, the farewells and the handshakes, and then you walk out into the yard and everybody's out in the yard together and the farewells and the handshakes. And oftentimes, you will accompany the guest if he is walking on the road for half a mile or so to continue the conversation and then another round of handshaking and uh, farewells and so forth. This generous hospitality that's reaching out to the other person uh, is just permeates uh, African uh, commitments to peacemaking and to developing harmonious relationships. It's a, a delightful experience. There's an Arab proverb that says that he who has gone to Africa one time and drunk the refreshing streams of that continent will find himself going back again and again to be refreshed thereby. The refreshment of African hospitality. Very special. I commend uh, that experience to you.